see what you guys can see. Looks good. All right. So um, this is just going to be a little bit of a refresher. Um, I haven't talked to you guys in a while. We were doing some checking in earlier this afternoon. We were doing your CLG evaluation with new staff. And um, we actually haven't done a check-in since at least 2016. So I think you guys were due in 2020. And then of course, you know, things happened. So we are back. So um, just kind of want to go over a little bit about uh, what CLG uh, program is about and then talk to you guys a little bit about why we do design review. So if um, you survive long enough, you're revered, rather like an old building, Catherine Hepburn said. And then, of course, Jackie Kennedy um, chimed in with her thoughts there. Um, we are the only country in the world that trashes its old buildings. Too late, we realize how much we need them. And then, of course, in Wretched Outcomes, the devil is in the details, Jane Jacobs. Um, and typically what we find with doing preservation and design review is a lot of times the devil is in the details. Um, and so that's why sometimes it's really important to make sure we have all the information we need and we get to sort of the meat of why we're doing a review um, and what, what options we have when it comes to the design review um, approval or denial. So with the new historic district coming in, um, I wanted to kind of highlight some of the commercial things. Um, uh, basically the, the commercial idea ideas of, of the review process so that we're going to use a lot of those um, examples tonight but these uh, standards and these guidelines and these laws apply to lots of different properties in, in um, Wyandotte County New Jersey. So as a reminder um, a refresher the CLG program or certified local government program was developed or started in the 1960s um, under the National Historic Preservation Act um, it created the state historic preservation offices in every state and territory. And then of course the tribes also have some tribal preservation offices. It's a partnership basically between the local government, whatever that looks like. It could be a city, a county, a parish, a village, um, but also the state preservation office and the national park service. And it's just really about becoming, um, having your local preservation program certified by the park service and then becoming a partner with the three, the three all together. So back in um, 1986, Kansas City, Kansas officially became a CLG and they entered into an agreement with the State Historic Preservation Office that was certified by the, by the National Park Service. Um, and I'll go into a little bit more detail later about how we are now getting ready to update that agreement and make it so that um, the UG is the certified local government. But I also want to talk about today um, why we do design review and why you all on the commission um, are going to be doing design review as the CLG moves forward um, and as more agreements come into place and some of the language and laws that you might hear about when we're talking about design review. So you may have heard of a COA or a certificate of appropriateness or sometimes called a certificate of approval. These are reviews that are mandated by your local ordinance. Uh, there are four designated buildings or historic districts that are locally designated. You may use the standards um, for, for rehabilitation like I'm gonna talk about later, but you also may have locally adopted guidelines or other standards in your ordinance. It's often triggered by the issuance of a permit, but not always. So you do want to review your ordinance periodically and make sure you kind of understand what is triggering the review. Um, there are 18 CLGs in the state of Kansas that I work with. And some of them have preservation ordinances that say all projects on locally listed buildings have to get a COA. But if I'm the property owner of such a property and I don't know that, <laughs> How am I going to know that I'm supposed to come to the Preservation Commission to get a review? So sometimes permits as a trigger is a good idea. We were talking about earlier that not everybody knows they're supposed to get a permit either. So that can be a challenge. Um, some certified local governments have a um, portion of their ordinance that includes environs and Kansas City is one of those. Um, we do have a couple other ones in the state of Kansas, but um, that was a a provision of the state law that went away a couple of years ago, and some of the CLGs have kept that. 
It can also include sometimes what we call a certificate of economic hardship. And so that is something that at the local level, you all can decide that if your ordinance allows it, you can grant a COA to folks that may not otherwise get an approval due to economic financial reasons. Um, appeals under your local review um, are laid out in your local ordinance. Sometimes they go to some other um, commission or sometimes they go up to the governing body. Um, sometimes in different municipalities, uh, you all have the final say. So it's really up to whatever the ordinance says. Now, comparing that to the state law, and I'll go kind of side by side here in a minute, the state preservation law is a state statute that was enacted back in the um, late 70s. And it uh, pertains to properties that are listed in the state of the National Register of Historic Places or Register Listed Historic Districts. We use the Secretary of the Interior Standards to review proposals, um, and it's always triggered by an action of the government. I like to tell people or explain to people that it's really not something that's supposed to be imposed on a property owner. It's actually a check and balance on the government. So the state subdivisions of the state, like counties and cities, are not supposed to undertake projects, permit projects, or fund projects that are going to damage or destroy historic property. And so that's what we're really looking at. Um, we review to determine if they will damage or destroy the listed property, and we use the Secretary of Interior Standards to kind of decide that. Um, whenever a state law review is um, turned down or quote unquote denied, the appeal goes to the local governing body, which could be the city council, the county commission, the school board. If it's at the state level, it goes to the governor. Just kind of looking side by side, you can compare and contrast these a little bit. Again, the COA is your local ordinance, whereas the state law is a state statute. Um, the COA is only for locally designated buildings and districts. It does not apply to state or national register list listed properties, whereas the state law only applies to state and national register listed properties. Um, the COA could have an environs component to it. The state law does not since 2013. Uh, COA uses standards that are adopted in the ordinance. It could be the Secretary of Interior Standards. In fact, if you're a CLG, it, it pretty much has to be the Secretary of Interior Standards. Um, the state law, we follow the Secretary of Interior Standards and any guidelines that we have available to us. <coughs> The COA, again, is often triggered by a permit, but not always, so double check your ordinance. The state law is triggered by an action of the state or local government, so it could be a permit. Um, and something that often gets confused under state law is that it does include interior work. So if a permit is required for an electrical upgrade or a bathroom remodel or something like that, even though it's on the interior of a National Register listed property, it triggers review. COAs typically are exteriors only or it defines in your ordinance what requires review. A COA, generally, it'll have something, a, you'll have a choice of how to um, make your decision. It'll be approved, approved approve with conditions or deny the COA. Um, the state law says it has to be either damage or destroy or not damage or destroy. And so those are the only things. You're not deter you're not approving it or denying it. You're either saying it does or does not damage or destroy the, the historic property. Um, and then of course, some local laws have that financial consideration. The state law does not. We can't take into consideration the financial feasibility of the project. Only the governing body can do that. So it's really something about the role that we have in that process. And I say we because the state preservation office generally does those reviews at the state level, but we can enter into an agreement with the CLG for you guys to do that at the local level. And that's something that we're working toward um, with, with Kansas City and PG. So like I've mentioned, um, because the original CLG agreement in 1986 was signed with the city of Kansas City, Kansas, um, when the unification happened with Wyandotte County, it basically technically nullified the agreement. 
and no one caught it. So we have been working under just sort of a pending agreement at the moment, um, trying to get everything back in order as far as <coughs> paperwork goes. Now that we know that, um, and you guys have a recently adopted new preservation ordinance, we're going to get all of the paperwork together. In fact, Janet's been working on that. Um, ooh, Gunner, I don't know what that is. <laughs> That's okay. Um, and Janet's been working on getting all the paperwork and everything together. We basically just have to send a copy of the ordinance, the new CLG agreement that we'll work up, and resumes for all the commissioners to the National Park Service. Um, and they should very easily, uh, basically what they will do is they will decertify Kansas City, Kansas, and then they will certify the unified government. Um, once the unified government is recertified as a CLG, we're going to talk more about having an agreement to do state law reviews. Um, and so we probably will start off with an agreement that allows you to do administrative or minor reviews um, at the local level and then kind of work our way up to major reviews in the, in the future. Do you guys have any questions at this point about sort of the certified local government program and the process that we use? Um, we're gonna talk through the Secretary of the Interior standards. Um, but any questions about why we review things under standards based on the state or the local law? I will have some questions about the standards, but not about Okay. That, so. And we can go along and feel free to, if, I, if I'm going along and you need me to stop and, and address something, just, just holler out. Mr. Mr. Chairman, can I interrupt just a second? Um, I need to remind everyone that when you get ready to speak, could you please state your name first and then go ahead and speak? Thanks, Janet. Thank you, Madam Secretary. <laughs> so the Secretary of the Interior standards for the treatment of historic properties is the big overarching standards that the National Park Service under the Department of the Interior has. Um, there are at least four um, sub standards that we talk about. Uh, preservation means to protect or maintain historic property sort of as it is right now. Restoration would be removing anything that's not of a particular period and going back to a certain point in time, repairing, recreating to that point in time. Reconstruction is where you either hold or impart reconstruct missing elements all the way up to maybe an entire new building. Um, but typically when we're talking about the standards and doing design review under either local law or state law, or even if you're talking to someone about using historic tax credits or a grant program, we're talking about the standards for rehabilitation. And the reason that is, is because standards for rehabilitation are probably the most flexible of those four. Uh, it's basically just making it usable while preserving, restoring, or reconstructing elements to keep the historic integrity of the building. So, for example, you may have a historic house museum um, and you want to preserve it just as it is. You're not trying to make it better or repair or improve it at all. You're not trying to make it livable. Um, so you just want to preserve it as sort of a, a time capsule. Alternatively, you might look at a different type of museum or historic site where you're actually trying to restore it back to a certain point in time. Like, for example, when a president lived there. Um, and so you want to remove all of the things that happened after that person lived there or after that event happened at that place. That's restoration. Reconstruction is like this is showing here where there's a missing part of the building or an entire building is missing but you know what it looked like. And so you reconstruct it exactly the way it was. You might leave as this one did um, a little bit of a scar or a remnant to show that it's a reconstruction. But typically we're dealing with buildings that we are trying to use um, and keep in use over, over the course of time. And so we may need to put on a new addition. We may need to put in an elevator or update electrical and HVAC and um, plumbing. And so we still want it to be comfortable for modern use, but we want to retain the historic elements too. So that's, that's rehabilitation. When we start looking at properties to determine if something does or doesn't meet the standards, 
I always start by first looking at the building to determine what are the character defining features. Does the building have integrity of historic design, materials, place? And then what, is a, what about the building do we want to preserve versus what could change? So inside and outside, depending on what law we're looking at and reviewing under, we look at features, finishes, materials, how old are they? Are they significant to the period of the building? Um, in other words, have they, have they been there for more than 50 years? Have they been there longer maybe than the original materials were there? Have they been modified over time? Is this a standalone building or part of a historic district? So for example, the building on the left, I would think most of us could agree it has a lot of historic character defining features. You see the brick, you see the, the corner with the, um, the hipped roof, storefront materials, storefront design is all there, the beautiful arched windows. The building on right um, kind of lacks historic character, right? Like, you can tell there's there's an old brick building under there, but most of it's covered up or damaged or modified to the point that it really is lacking historic integrity. So what this means is that if both of those buildings are undergoing rehabilitation and they're in a historic district, let's say, um, the building on the left, there's a lot more to preserve there, um, which kind of means that there are less options for what they can do with it as far as like what what we would want them to change, but there's also more opportunity there for them to highlight character defining features. The building on the right is completely lacking in integrity, probably is not a contributor to the historic district. It's not gonna qualify for tax credits. It's not gonna qualify for a grant. There's an opportunity there for them to do something much better and what they do to it has less of an impact on the historic district because like, they probably couldn't do much worse, right? So. so the Secretary of the Interior Standards, there are 10 of them. And I always point out that it's probably not a coincidence that there's the 10 commandments or the 10 Bill of Rights, right? So the 10 standards, they're pretty vague, overarching, um, hopefully flexible, hopefully usable enough to be used on any kind of historic property. We use them for everything from buildings to also bridges and locomotives and statues. <laughs> so they try, to, they try to keep them vague for that reason too. But standard number one says that the property should be used as it was historically used or placed in a new use that requires minimal change. So one of the things we look at with some properties is if you're trying to put a new use in a building that just doesn't fit the building, and it's gonna require you to make such substantial changes to it that it's really going to change the character of the building, it probably doesn't meet standard number one. So for example, these buildings are getting a, a new commercial use that requires the storefronts to be more enclosed than they were historically. That's not recommended by the standards. In some cases where enclosing the storefront is a requirement. For example, the, the building on the left there that says um, Bud Light and has the, the, um, the bar signage, um, it was a local ordinance that if it was a drinking establishment that it couldn't be um, open, the windows couldn't be transparent to the street front. Um, <laughs> and so instead of replacing the storefront or like boarding up the windows or doing something like that was not reversible, um, they chose to just use signage, which was just a, like a vinyl stick on lettering um, instead. So that's something that's reversible, it's compatible, um, and it doesn't hurt any of the historic materials. Standard number two says that historic character of a property should be retained and preserved. So when it does have historic integrity, you want to preserve what is left removing historic materials and altering the, the feature spaces that characterize a property should be avoided. So you can see at the top of this building, something's been cut off. This building had a metal slip cover at some point and the pieces of the historic facade that were sticking up above it got chopped off. Um, so that's obviously something we would not recommend if this was happening today. Um, there's a better photo of this building later. It gets, it has a good 
you know, good ending, um, a happy ending, but um, this is just an example of what we're talking about. Like we don't want this to happen to other buildings. I underlined features and spaces to point out that it's not just facades. Most of these examples are facades because that's the easiest thing to show. But when we are reviewing the interiors of buildings, it also has to do with the volume of space. So if it's a church or a gym or a theater that has a big open space or even a commercial building like this, that you walk in and there might be a lobby or a commercial retail space, you want to avoid um, cutting those in, in half and subdividing them as much as possible. Standard number three says properties should be recognized as a physical record of our time, place, and use. And I always point out that that's, if you really think about it, that's one of the things that really calls us to do what we're doing here. Why are we preserving these buildings in the first place? There's lots of reasons from everything from sustainability to preservation of just history to economic development. But one of the things I like to point out is that authenticity of the historic materials is one thing that one of the reasons why, why we do historic preservation. Walking up to a building and actually touching the thing that's 100 years old um, it is, is powerful. Um, and so that's why a lot of people like historic buildings, the character, the quality of materials, and just that connection with our past. So changes that create a false sense of historical development, like adding conjectural features or architectural elements from other buildings should not be undertaken. Um, my boss calls this kind of shake on in buckaroo revival, um, which happened a lot, um, especially in like the 60s, because a lot of people wanted to make their buildings more old timey. Um, and this is not what historically downtown Kansas street fronts looked like, even in the Cowtown days, like they did not have awnings like this. Um, once buildings became brick and metal, um, with the pressed metal on the one um, closest to us, they would not have had old timey shake shingles on them. And that's, that's a conjectural thing that's it's not appropriate for um, these kind of historic buildings. Um, and the, the kinds of awnings that would have been appropriate for those, those kind of buildings would have been more canvas or you know, the, the striped kind of um, fold out awnings that you see in a lot of downtown Main Street type historic districts, but not all historic districts have those kind of buildings. So where we have modern, mid-century modern 20th century buildings, which um, you know, I, I point out that these are probably from the 40s and 50s, but if you think about the 50-year cutoff of most of the National Register properties, 50 years ago was 1972 now. So that is a completely different era of building. And those don't typically have, I mean, they never had shake awnings, but they wouldn't have had striped canvas awnings either. And they would have had metal um, or no awning at all in some cases. Standard number four talks about historic changes. So things that occur to a property over time, sometimes those changes acquire historic significance in their own right. I mentioned earlier that a building like the Pegues department store in Hutchinson. It was built in the 19 teens, but by the 1950s, it had become pretty dated as a department store and they wanted to modernize. And so they put this metal panel facade on it and completely modernized the interior to the 1950s with teal and pink and chrome and all kinds of things. Um, and then it was that way into the 21st century. So it was that way longer than it ever was the brick and terracotta 19 teens building before it. So when the developer came and wanted to rehab this building, um, we were like, that's fine, but this is the, this is the historic facade. These are the historic character defining features of the building, not the 19 teens. Um, the restoration or the rehabilitation should preserve the 1950s um, storefronts and, and facade. <clears throat> other examples of those in other different places um, around the state, metal slip covers are fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you look at it, um, if they were installed in the late 60s, they may actually be historic now. 
we had a new historic district in Great Bend and several of their metal slip covers what we call cheese graters, um, this kind of thing. They actually have been determined to be, to be contributing to the historic district. Um, and sometimes they can be removed and the older storefronts revealed and still retain their contributing status, but sometimes not. And sometimes the buildings behind were too badly altered. And so the only way that those buildings can retain their contributing status is to keep the 1960s and 70s uh, metal slip covers. Ms. Ringler, um, one of our commissioners had her hand up a couple of standards oh, ago. Yes, I'm sorry. Do you mind if we just stop and see if anybody has any questions before we keep going? So does anybody have any questions about the standards this far? Does any of my fellow commissioners have any questions? This, this is Beverly Easterwood. I had a question about um, how do you treat um, window screens? Like if a building is being renovated and it did not originally have screens on the windows, how do you treat that? Um, honestly, we at the State Historic Preservation Office pretty much just, just roll with those. Um, residential buildings, even if there's no evidence that they had um, storm windows or screens, we recommend those because they do preserve the historic windows. Uh, and of course, it makes it easier to use and live in the building. Commercial buildings get a little bit more tricky because they didn't always have screens, but even if someone wants to put storm windows on the building, we still recommend that over not or over replacing the windows. Um, because again, it protects the historic windows if they're there and offers thermal efficiency and makes it easier to use the building. So if, let, let's say we have a historic school building that's being re rehabilitated into apartments. Um, we typically allow them to put screens on the storm windows because people want to open their windows, right? Like it's, it, it really doesn't make that big of a change to the historic appearance of the building as long as they're installed correctly. Um, some storm windows can be installed in a way that really don't look right, but. Did that answer your question, Commissioner uh, Eastwood? Uh, just look, one more. Uh, so if that's, that sounds like that if the original windows are remaining in place, but if the new, if there are new windows being installed, uh, would it be allowed to have uh, screens on the new windows that would be installed? I mean, everything's always a case-by-case -case basis. So if you guys are reviewing a project and you feel like screens are just really not appropriate for that building, like let's say it is a commercial building, maybe it's one of those, um, you know, a building like this or something that, you know, screens just would not work. Um, but if it's a residential building? If it was a residential building, I don't think that that would be a problem because it would, it, it would be typical to have screens on them. It's just a matter of their application and where, how they're installed. Um, okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Commissioner Schrader, did you have a question at this point? No. All right. If there's no further questions, please continue. All right. So standard number five says that distinctive features, finishes, and construction techniques or examples of craftsmanship um, should be preserved. So this is just further reiterating that if you have the historic materials, please preserve them. And if it's not even something that is uh, visible, maybe it's the craftsmanship of the building, maybe you, you're doing some kind of work to the building and you find a really unusual or unique technique that they use to build the wall, um, care should be taken to kind of preserve that or elements of it so that we can, you know, continue to learn from that in the future. Uh, there are publications from the National Park Service called Preservation Briefs. This is just an example of one, um, number 17, that it talks about architectural character and how to identify those aspects of historic buildings. Um, there are like 50 or 60 preservation briefs that we use routinely. And we recommend property owners, um, we reference those to property owners all the time. Um, they can be very, very helpful for that. Um, this I've got a question uh, yep. from one of the commissioners here. Commissioner uh, Schrader. Yeah, it's Commissioner Schrader. Um, so this is really where um, in a residential setting, 
um, don't paint brick and stone that's never been painted mm -hmm. because then that, that destroys its historic character. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the challenge there. You know, often in a residential area, uh, historic district, you know, they go, well, you're gonna tell me what color to paint my house. Well, no, but don't paint your brick and stone. Right. Yeah, we were, um, we were talking earlier about murals and um, the question came up of, you know, how do you, what, what's, your, what's your take on murals? And so I was explaining that from the historical side of the SHPO, we try to keep it very much to the standards and not, you know, the content of the mural is not our prerogative, um, but we don't recommend painting unpainted brick. Um, we don't recommend putting the mural over architectural details. So if there's a side of a building that has architectural, you know, terracotta or, or gate, you know, corbeline or something on it, like don't paint over that. Um, but, you know, if it's, a, if it's a party wall that has stucco on it because it wasn't meant to be exposed, the stucco is already protecting the brick, what's under there. So putting paint on it isn't going to hurt it. Now, from the standpoint of you guys being on the local preservation commission, um, you know, you may have other guidelines that guide you. So if you have downtown design guidelines that say murals are only appropriate in these places, or you have a sign code or something that says, you know, murals are only to be applied X, Y, Z, that, that restricts the property owner in other ways that are outside of the preservation. But yeah, you're exactly right. Like we don't recommend painting unpainted brick, period. It doesn't matter if it's a mural or if it's just something you saw on HGTV. <laughs> Either way, we don't recommend it. Ms. Ringler, this is got her hand up as a follow-up to that. As we mentioned, a lot of times these um, C of A's come to us as enforcement actions. So the work's already been done. Mm -hmm. So hypothetically, if someone were to paint their brick and then come to ask and ask for forgiveness, not permission, is the only thing worse than painting over your brick, removing it with a chemical? Or I mean, do we take it back? <laughs> Ideally, you can remove it with a chemical. Um, there, are, there are products. Um, we work with um, companies like Prosoco out of Lawrence. They have a lot of um, cleaning and, and paint removal and, and stain removal products that generally work pretty well, um, but they're not cheap. And there's always the danger of damaging the historic brick. Um, I think it's probably a judgment call or a case-by-case -case basis. You know, if the entire building has already been painted, that might be one that we just have to let go and monitor it. If it's one side of the building that, you know, the work has stopped at that point or if it's a partial wall that might be something to take a look at seeing if it could be removed but what we don't want to see and it's a couple standards later here is doing like abrasive treatments that is going to really damage the the, the paint could potentially damage the brick but removing it with like an abrasive is definitely going to damage it so we don't want to do that either but okay. yeah any other questions right now Standard number six is the one that most people are familiar with. They kind of recognize that this is what the preservation, you know, the, the preservation people do. Um, so when you have a deteriorated historic feature, it should be repaired rather than be replaced. But of course, where certain features get deteriorated beyond repair, you may have to replace it. And so what we look at is a step-by-step -step process. We look at the historic feature and say, first of all, is it deteriorated beyond repair? Yes or no? If it is deteriorated beyond repair, then what do you want to replace it with? And does that replacement match? And it says here in the standards, match the old in design, color, texture, and, where, and other visual qualities and where possible materials. So it's really about the visual match. Um, want to match sort of the, the appearance and look of it. If we can match the same materials, that's great, wood for wood or metal for metal, but that's not as important as the visual match. When something is missing, like for example, the windows might be missing or the cornice might be missing, you don't want to just replace it with something 
that would create that false sense of historic development, you want to replace it with something that you've documented. Um, or as we'll talk about later, at least something compatible. <coughs> Excuse me. Some of that building. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. So because we knew from historic photos what the um, gable tops and the little uh, finials on the top of the building looked like, they were able to replicate and restore those. Um, probably if we didn't have historic photos or we didn't know what they looked like, you could have put back something that at least continued the line of the pediment, but we wouldn't probably have recommended putting back the little finials and things on top because we weren't sure that's what those looked like. Occasionally I'll get a call from somebody who owns a little historic schoolhouse or something and they say, well, I want to put back the the bell tower. And I'll, my first question is always, well, do you know it had a bell tower? <laughs> and they may or may not know. And they'll say, do you know what it looked like? And they may or may not know from photos or something. But if they don't know, then our recommendation is not to put it back because if we don't know what it looked like, then that's conjecture. It may not have had a bell tower. It may not have had a bell tower that looked the way you think it looked. And so you're recreating something that would be false um, to that historic property. So as I mentioned, you wanna use the gentlest means possible when you're doing any kind of um, treatment to a historic property. Chemical, physical treatments like sandblasting or any kind of blasting at all, even water can be damaging to the historic property. So you wanna be very careful when you are doing something like cleaning a historic property you should only do it if it's absolutely necessary. For example, we don't recommend cleaning historic buildings unless one, um, the dirt is damaging the historic property, like it's some sort of mildew or mold or something that's actually like damaging the historic material or the building's undergoing some repairs and it has to be cleaned in order to match and stick the new, the new repair to the old. So, the bottom right there is a gentleman who's doing testing on the, um, the, cap the state capitol building in Topeka. They did test patches, you can kind of see there at the left, of different materials to clean the stone before they did the restoration. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, standard number eight talks about archaeology. It's not something we think about a lot. Obviously, archaeologists think about it, but we don't always. Uh, we tend to deal with the stuff that's above ground, but some of the projects that we are reviewing and talking to property owners about will involve digging. Uh, maybe they're replacing a, a sewer line or they're fixing their foundation. And it is possible that they may run into archaeological deposits. Uh, they may or may not be significant as far as like age wise, but they can tell us more about what was going on in that property historically. Um, and I mean, let's face it, they're pretty cool. So a lot of times property owners want to know more about them or they want to uh, display them or, or keep them in some way. This is just basically a reminder that sometimes archeological resources can be impacted by a project and if possible, they should be protected and preserved. Um, when resources have to be disturbed, they should just be kind of um, taken out and then kept or um, curated in some way. Um, in Kansas, my, um, my department, we deal with the state historic preservation office, but we have a sister department, um, which is the state archaeology office. And if anybody ever has a question about what is this thing I found in my yard, or <laughs> um, how old is this thing I found, um, our office can help with that. Um, and the state archaeologists would remind me to remind you that if anybody finds bones that they are supposed to call the sheriff not us so call the sheriff make sure it's not a crime scene and then if it continues to be unrelated to a crime then we can take over from there miss ringler real quick yeah. this is gunner hand director planning urban design uh, on this one it's we had a case for instance just this past month 
where we were informed by the neighbors that they thought there was an archaeological site on this proposed project. Mm -hmm. And then there was all kinds of sensitivity to that site because we didn't want to pinpoint it in our staff report or talk about it exactly or anything of that nature, right? It was like a hundred acre parcel. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the state archaeologist who came out and looked at that kind of instructed us specifically how to deal with that information in the public yes. light, right? Yes. I say that to say, I don't see how other than someone with good faith saying, oh, I just dug a hole and there seems to be stuff in here. Nine times out of 10, it seems like someone would just cover that right back up and keep moving on with their project, right? So, I mean, is that basically yeah. what it is or are there resources at SHPO that we should be looking at when we're doing our reviews to make sure there aren't some notable stuff? So I think, and it probably is, is gonna be more for the UG, um, rather than the individual property owners, because really the individual property owner, like you said, is probably just going to like, they found a cool thing in their yard and they might be interested about it or whatever. But if the, um, if the local government is doing a project, you know, like the one you're talking about, or like, let's say you're doing a street repair or something and you uncover trolley tracks or some, you know, something that indicates like, oh, this is where the old Oregon Trail you went through or some, you know, um, that is probably going to be something that's more like going to be more significant that you're going to want to call out an archaeologist for. Um, and then, of course, anything that requires like federal funding or a federal agency, there's going to be a clearance process that my office is going to look at both the archaeology and the above ground resources. Um, one suggestion would be that the city of Manhattan, several years ago, they knew that there was going to be a lot of development pressure along Wildcat Creek. Um, and there was knowledge and suggestion from folks at K-State that they knew there were archaeological or likely to be archaeological resources along that tract. And so they used some historic preservation grant money that my office has <coughs> and conducted our archaeological survey, just like we were talking earlier today about doing um, historic surveys of neighborhoods, you can do an archaeological survey of a particular area, um, locate, see if there are archaeological sites there, and then at least, you at least know from a planning perspective um, if those are areas that you should, you know, avoid or, or be aware of during, um, you know, development projects. It, it, is a, it is a touchy thing because technically, unless you are qualified as an archaeologist, you're not really supposed to know where the archaeological sites are, but if you don't know where they are, then you can't avoid them, so it's hard. Yes, sir. Technologically, how do those archaeological surveys, how are they conducted? Are they, are they using uh, ground radar or what are they doing? Um, it just depends. Um, phase one is just sort of like where they walk along the ground and just look. Um, and then phase two, they would be doing like shovel testing, um, but they probably wouldn't even do that much without looking at their maps and kind of predicting where they think people might have had activity there. Um, in fact, my office funded the beginning of a predictive model um, this last year with the Kansas Geological Service. Um, and that helps our archaeologists a lot, is they kind of look at, is it by water, is it on the upland, is it in a particular area, is it likely that there would be human activity here, or is it not really a place where humans would probably have congregated? And then they just kind of test that with, but we do, we do some ground penetrating radar and things like that too sometimes, yeah. Uh, I don't want to take too much time on a diversion here, but I did cringe when you showed the tavern that had covered the windows in the front. Yeah. Um, for decades, I owned companies that did uh, contract glazing and, and uh, glass replacement when we had to. Mm -hmm. And we spent a fair amount of time going around replacing the old polished plate windows in these buildings with um, tempered glass, tempered float glass because the first thing that happened after they put insulation or paper or cardboard or signage, there's some kind of mm -hmm. against the back of those old windows, 
Uh, they built up the heat gain in the center of the glass that absorbed solar energy, but the edge was still shaded and, yeah. and sometimes frame conducting heat away from the edge. So you had a cold contracted edge on a glass with the expanding center and they promptly break. Yeah. And so whenever someone wants says, well, we're just gonna cover up the window. Uh, if it's got the old, old polished plate glass in it, you might wanna get them to stand that back mm -hmm. and provide some ventilation and do something to hold the heat gain in the glass down in the- Now that you say that, that because they'll they'll break like popcorn. Yeah, we um we had a call from a, a local historical society that they have a downtown commercial building that they've made into their museum, and like you're saying, they've kind of made it's not right up against the glass, but they've made sort of a display window in the front, and couldn't figure out why they keep getting you know condensation in there. And it's like, well, you've made a little micro environment that yeah has created this this problem. So. Um, we are down to the last two. Standard number nine um, is one of the two Romanian standards that can get a little complex, but we'll work through these here. So new additions, exterior alterations, or related new construction shall not destroy historic materials that characterize the property. New work shall be differentiated from the old and shall be compatible with the massing size scale and architectural features. Um, of the property and its environment. So there's a lot to unpack there. Um, so it's saying that when you have new stuff happening with the property, you don't want to destroy the historic, the historic materials that characterize the property. So for example, this is a building in Hutchinson. You can see the storefront on the left there in the lower. Um, you know, sometime maybe in the 1980s or something they did they did something there, right? But they at least they preserved the cast iron columns. Um, they just didn't put back a storefront the way that we would have recommended. So what the standard says is new work should be differentiated from the old. This is definitely differentiated, but it also has to be compatible with the massing size scale and architectural features. And that kind of storefront just isn't compatible with this historic building. You can see on the right, um, the lower right there, the, the old storefront isn't historic. It's not the original storefront other than this cast iron, but you can see it at least has the pair of doors. It's out at the sidewalk. It has display windows. Um, it's more compatible than the one on the left for sure. When they redeveloped this property, they wanted to replace that left-hand storefront and do something that was more compatible and so this is what they came up with. It's metal. It's not going to trick anybody into thinking that it's the original storefront at all. Um, the proportions are a little, a little different than we would have seen historically, but it has a bulkhead. It has the paired doors. It has a transom level. They retain the historic cast iron columns. Um, and it's definitely compatible with a historic storefront, but it's differentiated enough that it's not going to create a false sense of historic development or you know, convince anybody that it is historic. So standard number nine is just calling for that balancing act between compatible but differentiated. And that comes into play too when we're talking about completely new construction. So if you have a, if you have a historic district, this one happens to be a downtown commercial district um, where you are putting in brand new construction and maybe a vacant lot, or where a building has been torn down or demolished, um, we're looking at the massing size scale architectural features rather than necessarily trying to make it match something that was there historically. So these are just examples of an infill construction and so I think it was probably in Nebraska or somewhere I, I was visiting. Um, but I mean, would you guys say that those are compatible if those were being built in downtown here? Would those fit in with your downtown historic district if they were put at the street level two to three stories high they have a cornice they have windows storefronts that's what we typically are looking at well this is commissioner schrader i mean and in addition you know the floor levels kind of match the window sizes you know continue mm -hmm. um so from that aspect these don't look like historic buildings but they 
they look like they might have been old buildings that just got refaced. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they kind of have that same theme to them. Right. They're they're not going to stick out like a sore thumb necessarily, right? <laughs> so, and though in reality, you know, the you know one of those buildings could have had you know purple accents or something, mm -hmm. and that still would have been fine. Yep. You know, um, it, it's they don't all have to be blah. Yeah. <laughs> But that, that is something that is is a but concern. coming in with something that was all glass mm -hmm. or fourteen stories tall mm -hmm. or something like that that would that would go over the that would definitely go over the threshold too far. We were talking about this a little bit earlier um, when we were when we were talking uh, touring around downtown, but um, from a standpoint with a shippo, we really try to focus on the massing size scale. Because if you can fit that box, then some of the other things fall into place. Yeah. So standard number 10 deals with, um, again, new additions, adjacent or related new construction should be undertaken in a way that if removed in the future, the essential form and integrity of the property is preserved. Um, and so we kind of call this the hyphen effect, where if you are trying to put a new addition, on a house, or in this case, a little Carnegie Library, you want to have a minimal touch to the historic property. That way, if the addition is removed in the future, it's not going to cause as much damage to the historic property as if you just slapped it right against the historic building. Um, so a lot of times you will see these with a little hyphen or a little connector that connects them. It's not as easy to do that in a downtown commercial setting because the buildings have party walls, and that's okay. Um, that's the historic character of a commercial district. Um, but in fact, you could have, I mean, that could all be one building. We don't know. And it just looks like it has four different facades on it, which is great. So the hyphen, standard number 10. The other way that sometimes buildings get additions is um, the rooftop. And that can be a challenge because especially when we're trying to promote density in downtowns um, or even in residential areas, people want to build up rather than out where they may not have the, the land to build out. Um, some buildings can tolerate a rooftop addition and some can't. Uh, usually a building has to be more than two stories tall to really have a rooftop addition that meets the standards. And even in those cases, it, the rooftop addition has to be set back far enough and low enough that you can't see it from the street or at least not, you know, you may really have to look for it. So this is an example in downtown Manhattan, um, a duck walls building that, I mean, you can see historically, it was a very plain building. The only thing that really stood out was it had a sign that said duck walls on it. Um, but it was like that historically. And so the Preservation Commission first had to kind of wrap their head around the fact that it was contributing, um, even though it was had been changed to a Joanne's. And they wanted, um, the new developers wanted to put a rooftop addition on it that was twice as big as the building. Um, downtown Manhattan mostly has buildings that are two, maybe three stories tall, except for the Ware Hotel down at the end of, of the district. Um, and so this new rooftop addition was going to be as tall as the Wareham. And there was just no way that this historic building could tolerate a, a rooftop addition that large. So we worked with the designers and said, you know, rather than, basically this is a standard number one issue. What you're trying to do with this building does not fit in the building. So let's look at a different use or a different, um, basically the layout for the building. So they went with uh, using them as a brewery restaurant and then it's in the least tell space and just use the rooftop as literally just additional dining space and congregating space. So the, the, the rooftop addition, all it had to be was big enough to have people come up the stairs and go out, maybe a little bit of storage or a little bar area. Um, and so in drawing and rendering, you can kind of see how that looked. Um, in reality, it's probably even better than that because when you're on the street, you really can't see it at all unless you kind of really stand back or go up or down the street. What you can see, and sometimes we as reviewers forget this, 
is the outdoor furniture. So the palm trees and the lighting and the big, I think you can kind of see it on the left there. They have like these heaters that, you know, you can move around. So if that's a concern, <laughs> when you're talking to a developer about a rooftop use for a building, keep in mind that it's not just the structure, it's also if the parapet isn't high enough, then they have to have a railing. And what will that do to the historic right. facade too? Um, there's ways to work with that, but sometimes we forget things like that and then we get surprised, so. This is Commissioner Schrader again. It, at least furniture and palm trees and even lights can be easily removed. So definitely. that helps, but uh, railings are a little harder sometimes. Yes, definitely. Director Han, I saw your light on. Did you have a question? Please continue. Okay. Um, so, you know, this is just kind of talking this through, but, you know, we, we get a lot of these in our office where people are replacing, maybe, maybe the historic storefront is missing and they want to put back a new storefront. You know, maybe it's a storefront kind of like that, that bar I showed at the beginning where it's infilled with brick and they want to open it back up, which is great. Um, but we have to always talk to them and review this for the standards to say, is it compatible and differentiated? Uh, a storefront like the one on the bottom right has the right dimensions for the typical sort of downtown Main Street commercial building. It has a bulkhead, it has display windows, it has a transom area up under the awning. The awning's in the right place. The top left is something more like what we tend to get. <laughs> um, they want to put, you know, very um, thick storefront tube, you know, extruded aluminum, um, tinted glass, and they don't typically get the proportions right on the bulkhead and the transom. And it has a detrimental effect to that particular property, but it also can really impact the historic district over time as more and more people do this. Um, I invite you to come to downtown Topeka sometimes you'll see lots of black storefronts with dark glass and the black aluminum framing. Um, you know, they aren't the worst thing in the world, but they're not really compatible with those historic buildings. And when 10 or 12 buildings in a downtown historic district do that, it tends to really have an impact over time. Um, just reiterating again, the National Park Service has lots of publications out there. So as commissioners, or folks out in the community or you're talking to property owners, um, just know that there are resources out on the web. As far as the preservation briefs, these publications are called Interpreting the Standards. They're basically case studies and, and they can demonstrate to folks how recommended or not recommended different treatments are. And then of course, I'm gonna put in a plug for grant funding because one of my other hats are, um, is the grants manager. And as a CLG, you guys get priority consideration for those grants. So looking ahead, applications for the 2023 grant round will be posted probably around the end of the year, and they'll be due around the end or the middle of March. And then we will award um, those grants in May. Um, products for those will be due around September of 2024. And Right now, there are three active grants going here um, between the downtown commercial district and the church's multiple property document, and then the um, community wide preservation plan. So thinking ahead um, of what else you might want to look at funding in the future, it could be a workshop, it could be going to a conference, um, it could be something like becoming a member of the National Alliance of Preservation Commissions, which I was explaining to Gunnar and Randy earlier, I'm just gonna put as a check, check mark on the grant application. And if you check it, we're just gonna make you a member because I think it's a lot easier to do it that way. Um, but realize that the, the NAPC also has resources for you all. Um, they do have example design guidelines. They have information on how to fund meetings. They have um, example codes of ethics, that kind of thing that help preservation commissions. They also have a program called CAMP, which is Commission Assistance and Mentoring Program, where you can bring in trainers and speakers to conduct 
a half day, a full day, whatever kind of training you guys want. Um, and of course, my grant program will fund that. And then just a plethora of other ideas. If you have any kind of idea of what you think the community might need or something that would help you all do, um, design review, like design guidelines, um, things like that could be grant products. So top left, we did a cemetery repair workshop. Top right, that is a walking tour, a story map for our city's downtown historic district. Um, middle right, they did a siding removal workshop where they actually took the vinyl siding off of a historic building. Um, <laughs> Randy's over here being all excited. Um, middle there, we do uh, what we call historic, um, historic structure reports or building assessments. So if you had sort of a white elephant in the community that you wanted more information about what preservation needs that building has, we could fund that. The archaeological survey I mentioned at the bottom right, and then of course there's comprehensive plans, and also um, we always are going to plug doing more historic uh, survey of anything in your community. We were even talking about earlier, even if, you, even if there's not visible historic resources in a particular area, you might want to do survey of things like the floodplain areas, because when I say when, not if, right? We have natural disasters. Um, the, the FEMA uh, folks who come will want to know where the historic resources are. And so if there is an area that's prone to flooding or something like that, if you can document the cultural resources or lack thereof, it makes those disaster responses go a lot faster. <laughs> 